Okay, we have two more artist statements. I know you are a bit tired, but uh, keep it up. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, so we have next one is Lotte Kanaudlu. She's going to talk about her work of art. And give a give an applause. Um, to say that you're tired is uh, an understatement. I'm like totally exhausted, so uh, I'll try to do this as entertaining as possible. But I don't know how entertaining it can become because I'm going to read it out because I'm not. My English is uh, not native. Um, this March, I was in Brooklyn Museum and experienced Judy Chicago the dinner party for the first time. And I realized that it's one of those work that is very good in the book, that, but it's mind-changing, life-changing when you see it in real life. That is a different difference. I'll use my 15 minutes of fame to introduce a happening that I'll organize with a group of students from Keogh Department of King's Hall this fall. But to introduce our project, I'll start somewhere else in 1998. The year after I finished the Academy of Fine Arts in Oslo, I was invited to exhibit in a very small and very short exhibition at the Astro Perlin Museum in Oslo. Actually, it was so small that it took place in a tiny, dark, isolated room in one end of the museum where nobody went. <laughs> and the duration of the exhibition was so short that it almost closed before the opening was over. <laughs> when I was preparing for the show, I got interested in the Astro Perlin Museum collection, which is a natural thing for an artist to become when you do an exhibition in a museum. The thing was, the Astor Fernley collection, when I started to look at it, had very few pieces by women artists. Actually, it was exceptional a few. A couple of paintings, one or two sculptures, but nothing significant, and nothing that gave an impression that to include women artists in the collection was, if not an interest, then a responsibility. Interest <laughs> and responsibility. Just to think about those words, the patronizing meaning in those words, when having my first exhibition after ending my education, and then to feel forced, and literally being forced, into a dark, small corner of a museum. It was the first time I felt treated like a minority, which was probably good for me. <laughs> and the first time I wondered if I needed if I needed to be part of a fixed quota to get into a private museum, and I felt like somebody had smuggled me in through the back door. <laughs> the whole exhibition was a wake-up call. It was something I did not expect. Because this is 25, 30 years after Judy Chicago. As I told you, this was in the late 90s, and I guess you could say that the idea of what a collection should be was changing in Norway. The idea of the collection is always changing, of course, but from a Norwegian perspective, the new question arised. It's not new worldwide, but it was new here. What the public versus private responsibility should be when it comes to art. Should the state, the government, or the private person provide society with its collective memory? The philanthropist way of thinking of art that Elizabeth Sackler from the Brooklyn Museum represent um, is a major and natural part of the American political system. Well, here is just about to start. And that's, that means that maybe that we can share the, the responsibility of women, or the representation of women artists with private people in the future, who knows? But by now, it's not shared by private people. Anyway, I'm gonna go back to my Astro Burnley show. I finally made a video that turned out to be a sound piece. When you walked around the museum and the Kitai paintings, that was the real exhibition at the moment, you could hear the sound of the video everywhere. I liked the effect of the sound on the architecture and the art. I liked it because, because it felt like I had managed to smuggle something in the back door myself. <laughs> and it was the first time I needed to show how I felt about being there where I was and where I was forced to be. So if you turn up the volume and you guys close your eyes for a second, you can imagine what it was like to go around and see the Kitai pictures. If you know Kitai, 
they show him or his pictures. Can you turn it up? Uh, <clears throat> the technician didn't uh, fix it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway, what she, huh? you can say. I'll tell you what she says. Actually, it started with this girl saying, you ignore me. But she says it in a very angry way. So she's going, you ignore me. She's not, uh, so the sound you hear all through the museum was, do you think, no, it doesn't work, is you ignore me. It's very sad that I think, actually. It's not gonna work, girls, so let's just move on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Many years later, I decided to make a collection. We've been talking about that today. And since I don't have the means, I don't have the money to buy a lot of art, I wish I had. I have been drawing the art myself. I started what I call the Bloom Collection in 2011, and so far I've drawn, drawn around 120 pieces. The collection has, or takes the liberty of being able to include any piece of art, since it cost me nothing but my time to make it. So far, I have only collected artists that live or have lived in Norway. Because this local collection, this is a local collection, at least until now. And it goes as far back as the independent Norwegian art history, which, as some of you know, is not very far back. <laughs> <laughs> I love art. I really do. And a lot of the pieces that I've been drawing need to be seen or to be experienced experience like I told you about the dinner party. It's not enough to see it in a book. It's not enough to see it there. I am pretending the pieces I enjoy, and I'm very well aware that there are images from my mind, more than the art piece they represent. But I do feel that there's a difference in the way I'm copying now than when I copied when I was 16 and I was copying in the National Gallery. I'm trying in a different way to understand, interpret, and touch the work by drawing it. I'm discussing by drawing. My arguments are my drawings. They raise questions that I would have not have raised if I had not done the drawings. It is understanding and reflection by experiencing. The discussion that arises through the work with the collection uh, is various. First of all, it raises a uh, question of power. <laughs> <laughs> then economy, and then taste. And then what a collection is. When exactly is something a collection? Is 10 a collection? Is 15 a collection? Or 20? Of what? Of anything? Of any piece? Or do I have to collect in a specific direction of something to call it a collection? Do I collect more women than men? Or the opposite? If I should collect more men than women, is that because I like male artists more than I like women artists? That would be a shock to me. <laughs> Or is it because I was presented to a canon and a language through my upbringing and my education that I cannot avoid? How much do I really know by art? If I was buying art with real money, would I get myself a person to buy my art for me, but to say in public that I was the one with the taste and the knowledge, like a lot of collectors do? Why would I collect art at all? Why is collecting art important? Today, we're talking about the economy like many today. <coughs> and finally, would I give the collection to the public in the end? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> all of these questions are part of the project um, that I want to introduce to you now. This fall, I'm going to do an exhibition with some of my students and maybe you, Grossen, I've invited her especially, at Opportunskunstsenter. And it's in relation to the 100 year university anniversary for the rights in Norway that you were introduced to at the beginning. It's a group show with us, 
uh, and uh, several other groups of artists. And the title is It's a Girl. <laughs> And somebody's talking behind the screen. <laughs> um, in a telephone, it's very strange. Uh, we have decided to use a book called Women Portraits in the Norwegian Arts of Painting, and it's from 1946. The only reason for using this book was that I found it in flea market last summer, and it turned out to be a book of some significance that was frequently used as a reference in its time. That means that it has been a part of what has created the culture around women and arts in Norway, of course, because everything does that. The, this book's uh, approach, the theme of women artists and, protests, er, er, and, and portraits, the, the approach to this, it right, right there in the title. Now you soon have to stop talking because I'm not able to do this. <laughs> um, there's not so much art made by women as of women, looking at women. And there's nothing new about that, but it has created an interesting discussion among our group, the students and me, how does each time treat gender in art? Can we disclose anything about present time by trying to understand another time? In this case, represented by portraits in the book. And a very, few, and a very important question is this. Am I able to see and understand different forms of suppression in my own time? And do I recognize it in the visual and literal language that surrounds art today? Do I take a personal responsibility to take a step back and try to view my own time and the language? When we in our group have tried to find out, find out about women artists and books, we found out that there were astonishingly non-existing in the collection of the National Gallery. They have to be managed. They don't exist anymore. Gone. <laughs> Looking up the artists in the book on the internet made us become interested in the general representation of artists on the net. So far, we've found that there are an interesting and understandable mix of high and low on open places like Wikipedia, while on edited places like the Norwegian Encyclopedia, where there are in general a very poor representation of visual arts, there are written more about men than women artists, of course. <coughs> but having said that, there is a lot of male artists that should have been written, about, uh, written a lot more about that are absent as well. And it might have to do with the economy thing that they possess. You know, in a moment, but uh, now we can see some of that. So this is the piece, and you can hear it already. Turn it down. Uh, so, a little bit late, but we got it in. Um, anyway, so this fall, uh, me and my students are going to have two pop up events, uh, two happenings. 
that's going to happen in the Library of the National Museum of Arts, and the other one which represents the past. And uh, the other one would be the Library of Oslo National Academy of the Arts, which of course represents the present and the future. In these events, we want to gather as many people as possible to work together. Our intention is to write as much as possible about artists that are not represented on the net, or that are not represented to the degree they should be represented. We want to keep the project as simple and ad hoc as possible. We do not want to build an administration around this, because this is actually something you can do at home if you have a computer. And it can grow. Like Becky said, let's do this. I want to we want to collect names before we start, and we want to spend two whole days doing research, write, proofreading, er, proofreading, and finally write the text into the various open sites on the net. And hopefully, a lot of artists will be there with us in persona, which means that you can talk to the artist about her work to get the facts correct. Hopefully, she won't lie. The intention of the project is first of all, the energy of working together, which means that it cannot fail. Then there is this, and I have to say, fantastic thing about the internet. The internet, if you think about it, is the information that is actually there. It is a hermeneutic circle that changes with every new piece of information that comes onto it. The internet is not a static thing, it's changing continuously. Maybe we can change the hits that people would get when they look up Norwegian art history or Norwegian contemporary art. Is that possible? Of course, one can change a field by changing the way it's presented, read, and used. The internet attack is an experiment where we all would benefit from learning the other side of art history and in Camille's words, the one, the art history that is there, but is not told about. In the spirit of Jude Chicago, and the Nader Party, and we want a, a future where any young artist will feel welcome in the main entrance of a museum. Um, I, want, I, want, I thought this place would be the perfect place to invite you all to take part in the project, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and and uh, because it's an open project, and I want to welcome you all to work with us to write and to be written about.